Back in Valkid, Archbishop Krar is told of everything that had transpired, which certainly has left them with a lot of things to go through. What will happen to the church now that Bardus no longer exists? Will humanity, formerly split among light and darkness, come together and find ways to coexist? Though the immediate aftermath among the continent would no doubt be unrest and fear, this is perhaps the final trial given to humanity by the gods. Muse assures Krar that the royal family of Alfilden will do everything in their power to cooperate with the church in these coming times, as everyone commits themselves to further collaboration in the times ahead. The Magic Academy, the Barony of Beloa, the Adventurer's Guild, and even Mitchell still determined to brave the Gagarv and reach distant shores with Thomas, now work together to embolden the world for the future. If the world-ending calamity is to occur, it might not even happen on Alfilden. It is now necessary for them to finally cross the abyss beyond the continent and visit the new worlds. Even if their story is over for now, Terrasville and that third continent beyond the Gagarv surely will have their own troubles and their own group of heroes that will rise to the occasion. But that is all for the future. For now, the team has more than earned a well-deserved rest. Krar invites everyone to stay the night in Valkid. The Planetos will arrive the next day in Brijak to take most of the crew back to Boreas so that they may return to where they belong. Avon, Mayo, Emil, and Rutes wander around Valkid. Come to think of it, Emil and Mayo had never properly toured the Holy Capital, and today seems like the perfect time to relax before they all head home tomorrow. As they make plans to travel the city, it almost seems like they've forgotten someone. Oh, right. Having just come back to life, Mile finds himself almost strangled alive again. With all of Shannon's antics since they first met back in Tibri, she's managed to become a member of the crew in her own unique, rambunctious way. Deciding to invite Shannon along on this day of relaxation, much to Mile's dismay, the team prepares to set off. But then, Rutus, seemingly quiet and glum since everything that had happened, suddenly excuses herself and walks off. Sensing that she's terribly troubled, Emil and Mayo urge the somewhat blockheaded Avon to go after her. After all, he is perhaps the only person that can truly understand her, even if he doesn't fully understand it yet. Avon catches up to Rutus, locked deep in thought in the streets of Valkid. Tomorrow they will both return to Boreas, Avon to his home and Rutus back to Ruka. Thinking back, they've traveled together for a long time now. Avon admits that now, imagining his life without Rutus constantly beside him is somewhat lonely. And then she tries to speak up, but finds it difficult to summon the words that she wanted to say. On the next day, the Planetos sails off from Brijak port, bound for Boreas. With Gawain and Lucius remaining in Deuces to continue their work, the rest of the crew board the ship to head off. But Rutus, exchanging one last longing look with Avon, also stays behind, splitting up from him. As Avon boards the ship, their conversation from the previous day replays in his head as they set off on the long journey home. With everything that had wrapped up, Rutus found herself thinking about the future of the cult, filled with many people much like herself in her childhood. Those that sank into darkness after their yearning for the light were denied. Thinking about it, all of them were pitiable in their own ways. Avon can't help but agree. Perhaps in another reality where he lost both Emil and Mile, he too might have given into despair and become a member of the cult. But Rutus disagrees. Avon is a very spirited person and wouldn't give in to despair like that. Avon tells Rutus that she too is stronger than she thinks. After all, she's conquered the demons in her own heart to get to where she is today. 
but Rutus instead thanks Avon for teaching her what it feels like to cherish her own loved ones and the unending will to relentlessly move forward through obstacles. Avon too is grateful for her presence. Without her, he could have never successfully rescued Emil and Mile. As they both look to each other with gratitude, they fell into an awkward silence. Perhaps they were thinking the same thing, but neither of them found the courage to say it out loud. The awkward silence is broken as both of them burst with laughter. A small, intimate moment like this is rare, but it felt nice. Avon then makes a move, offering Rutis and Ruka to move in with him in the lookout cottage. After all, it's a very large place. Why not move in and make it their own home as well? But that's when Rutis suddenly looks away and breaks the news to Avon. She's not planning to go back to Ruka. Not now, because her journey hasn't finished yet. Avon is shocked that Rutus would refuse to go back even now, but this time her face is no longer troubled by the thought of reuniting with her brother. Instead, her disposition is one of stern determination. She tells Avon that in Southern Deuces there are still renegade members of the cult, those that refuse to believe in Belius' death and Octum's fall. Even now they carry out resistance operations against the church. As someone who was formerly their comrade, Rutus wishes to stop the renegades and guide them back to peace. This is her duty. This is the path that she has chosen, and the journey that she must walk. Avon, unwilling to let Rutus go alone, demands to accompany her, but she turns down his offer. For one, his journey is already over. It's time for him to live with Emil and Mayo in peace. And besides, someone like Avon would never be able to undertake this mission. Avon's bright disposition and his unwavering faith, the embodiment of what Durga called the Tear of Vermilion, would instead stir envy in the hearts of the renegades. A mission like this can only be carried out by Rutus, alone. Rutus apologizes to Avon. Even though he's helped her so much, she knows that this isn't what he wanted in the end. But her resolve is firmer than ever. This is her own path to walk so that she can finally stand independently and be the strong person that she needs to be for Ruka and for Avon. In response, Avon blurts out his feelings. This isn't a desire to help. This is a sense of love and care from the depths of his heart. For Rutus's sake, he's willing to do anything for her because he's in love with her. Rutus interrupts Avon and begs him to not finish that sentence. Not now. Not here.
Tearfully, Rutus thanks Avon for his feelings. She is relieved and happy that they feel the same about each other, but they simply cannot confess now. To do so now would rob her of all of her determination to set out on this dangerous journey. Steeling himself, Avon nods in understanding, and firmly tells Rutus that he will just wait for her instead. He will wait as long as it takes for Rutus to finish, and when her duty is said and done, he asks her to come to the lookout cottage first. Ruka can wait, they can go see him together. As for their future, they can talk about it then. Rutus protests. This journey is exceptionally dangerous. There's no way to know how long it will take or if she'll even return alive. But Avon insists. Perhaps one day, impatience will get the best of him and he'll set out to find her, but he will do his best to wait for her return, no matter how long it takes. He won't try to stop her from finding her path in life. He's willing to send her off on her own adventure with a smile and a promise so that she may walk her own road to the end with no regrets. The two lovers join hands, tears brimming in their eyes. With a breaking voice, Rutus quietly swears an oath to Avon. She will come back to his side, safe and sound, someday. Since then, seasons turn, time flows, many days pass by in the blink of an eye. The Church of Bardas makes an official decree to the people of Elfilden, announcing the end of the Era of Gods. Predictably, much turmoil initially struck the land, but thanks to the ceaseless efforts of many individuals involved and the strong ties between the Church and the Royal Throne, the people endured, and peace eventually returned to the continent. A new world order was setting in. The Church of Bardas remains in effect, though this time without a god to worship. However, the symbolic gesture of the Church's continued existence and the act of prayer itself remains a pillar of unity that stabilizes the hearts of individuals. The message across the world is clear. The gods only act in accordance to their own principles. Humanity must now learn to stand on their own and find their purpose without relying on a pillar of their own faith. To each their own, as people's lives continued, in more or less the same way as they were before. In some places, it is simply business as usual. In others, there are groups that have turned a new leaf. New friends and lifelong companions or even old rivalries quashed and then sparked anew. Sometimes the more things change, the more they tend to stay the same. In some ways, it's as if the gods have never left at all. Avon's adventure resonating with the hearts of the many companions he's made along the way, and the infinitely more souls that have been touched in this journey, stands as a clear and stalwart reminder. Together, as bonds new and old join into one, the world will always see tomorrow. Humanity shall stand against any coming obstacle and surmount it together, no matter how difficult the climb may be.
Soon the year has turned back to spring, and the harvest festival in Ward Village has once again come around. A meal is bubbling with excitement. This is the first time that she'll attend one for herself. The festival is rowdy as ever, including the annual wishing card event. The people are eager to cast wishes down to Neftis, who no longer exists. Even though the guardian deities are gone forever, it doesn't seem right to abandon a popular festival tradition. The three friends gather to discuss what they're going to wish for, and Avon suddenly falls silent. After all, there's really just one wish lingering on his mind. Suddenly, the familiar voice of a girl shouting Miles' name can be heard from a long distance away, a voice that manages to send chills down Miles' spine, just as it has many times before. Shannon, spirited as ever, has also come to attend the Harvest Festival and help out the Ward villagers with festival preparations. But Avon, still silent over his own thoughts, decides to walk off to cut some logs for the festival, opting to do some labor to clear his head. Seeing him walk off, Emil and Mayo can't help but comment on his stubbornness. Emil mentions how restless he's been getting. Why not just head off and try to find Rutus? But Mayo believes that Avon is stubborn enough to keep waiting, even though it's been quite an ordeal for him. Hearing Rutus's name, Shannon suddenly pipes up. She didn't come here alone. Returning a pile of lumber to the storehouse after some hard work, Avon hears the voice he's been longing for. The voice that's been missing from his life for almost a year now, calling out to greet him filled with that unique sense of charm and spirit that he's come to treasure and love. He's been working hard to keep himself healthy, just in case one day he decides to set off to find that stubborn girl who insisted on journeying alone. Avon turns around to find Rutus, tearfully telling him that at last, she has found her way home. Meanwhile, on the distant seas, Mitchell and Thomas are preparing to embark on their next journey to breach the Gagarv. Thanks to the combined efforts of many hardworking magicians and engineers, the Planetos, now equipped with reinforced frames forged using Mirage Metal, has been renamed the Planetos II. With this ship, the two friends are certain that they will surpass that endless abyss to access the worlds beyond. Mitchell takes out the Aleutian and sinks deep in thought. Avon had passed this blade to him. The tale of this sword may have concluded in Alfilden, but surely somewhere on a distant continent, there are others who may need its power to fight their own battles. However, the powers of Bardas have long since been lost from this blade. Aleutian, in ancient tongue, roughly translates to Paradise of the Gods. It seems fitting now to give this blade a new name to christen in the era of humanity. Mitchell decides to rename the sword Esperanza. Translated from the languages of ancient civilizations past, it means bringer of hope. Perhaps on another continent, Esperanza will give them the same salvation that it has given to the people of Elfelden. But that is a story for another day.